speaking into the mic? Yeah? It was just working for me. Test, one, two. How does that work for you and not me? I don't know. Beer. Okay, we're going to start. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I want to take a brief, uh, a little, little time to introduce Dr. Allison Deary. She got her BS from uh, the College of Charleston in 2009 uh, in marine biology, uh, and she also did minors in chemistry and geology, which is pretty crazy to do all of it. Uh, but there are a couple of geologists in the crowd, so that makes them happy. Uh, she got her PhD from uh, Virginia Institute for Marine Sciences at the College of William and Mary in 2015. Her major professor was Dr. Eric Helton, and her dissertation uh, title was The Ontogeny and Feeding Apparatus and Sensory Structures and Its Relationship to Habitat Differentiation Among Larval Drums in the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> Studying phytoplankton, I find this riveting. Uh, her current position right now is she's a postdoctoral researcher in the uh, laboratory of Dr. Frank Hernandez at the uh, Gulf Coast Research Laboratory through the University of Southern Mississippi. And she's also uh, working on the Consortium for Oil Spill Exposure Pathways in Coastal River Dominated Ecosystems, <laughs> Concord. And uh, as part of the fun, um, consortium uh, money from the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, uh, Garmi. Uh, Dr. Deary, or Ali as I like to call her, she's been exceptionally productive. She's published four first author papers in the last two years. She's got another two in review. So that's excellent productivity for young scientists. Uh, she's been active in, huh. It could be. It just doesn't like me. That's okay. She's been active in uh, service. Melissa's gonna come and straighten things out. It's like McDonald's. Okay. Test one, two. Jeff for that uh, amazing introduction. So, um, and he is right. I tend to have very long titles and I also um, tend to fall asleep in really weird places. So I actually would fall asleep in this room on the ship that we call the sweat lab and that one of the crewmen brought me a beanbag chair. So whenever you're doing oceanographic work, always try to find your little hidey hole. And hopefully I wasn't in Jeff's and his crew's way too much. So I'd wake up every now and be like, oh, do I need to move? Um, so if for any of you doing projects right now, if you want some life advice, do not have a dissertation title that is that long. So it's never seemed too long until it gets read to you. So, um, But as Jeff said today, I'm going to be uh, focusing my talk today mostly on what I did during my dissertation, but then also give a little bit of an overview of what we hope to do during my uh, time with Concord. So this brings me to ecomorphology. So for those of you who are not as familiar with this field, it's a really um, interdisciplinary and, in my mind, cool field because it integrates aspects of uh, evolution, ecology, morphology, and physiology to understand essentially how organisms survive and how they live in their environments. And this is particularly a useful technique when we're thinking of fishes because there's over 35,000 species of fishes that have been described. So in order to maintain that level of biodiversity, there has to be ways that they're able to coexist. And ecomorphology enables us to study how these organisms are able to maintain that level of biodiversity. And if we just look at some of the variety of fish body plans that we see, immediately what jumps up at us is there's a, a lot of variation in the overall shape of their body, 
how long it is, how deep it is, as well as the relative size and positions of these fins. And the idea is that um, these structures of these fishes have been acted on by natural selection. So each individual body plan of each of these species is perfectly adapted for the habitat in which they are utilizing resources and inhabiting. So essentially there's this idea of trade-offs that one body plan, such as a lionfish, even though they're invasive here and everywhere, but this body plan is ideal for them to live in these reef environments. If you throw a lionfish into an open ocean arctic habitat, they do not have the adaptations to survive. And just to further um, elaborate on this idea of trade-offs, if we look at a grouper type body plan, what we see is they have this relatively deep body and these extremely large fins. So if we think about where groupers live, they live in these very structured reef habitats. And so the idea is they're constantly avoiding obstacles in their path when they're foraging and invading predators. So the idea is large fins give them a lot of surface area of the fin in contact with the water. So it makes them really maneuverable. So it allows them to very quickly avoid obstacles in their path and make these very tight turns. If you, but they're not very fast. This is a body plan that is not going to be an exceptionally fast body plan. They're maneuverable, but not fast. If you compare that to something like a large uh, my open ocean migratory fish like a tuna, we see that the body plan is very different from the grouper. They have this teardropped uh, fusiform and streamlined body shape that's essentially adapted to maximize speed. They have these elongate fins that are very stiff and they minimize the amount of fin in contact with the water to again reduce that effect of drag. So these are fishes that, again, natural selection has acted on their body plan to give them a form that's adapted to speed. And the trade-off comes in that this tuna is very well suited to its environment. If you threw this tuna into a highly structured habitat where a grouper, live, grouper lives, it is going to be out-competed by fishes with a body plan more similar to groupers. So that's just this idea that I want you guys to keep in mind as we go through the rest of the talk. And if we focus in, I'm primarily interested actually in foraging, partly because we all like to eat, right? Food's awesome, it's great, it's delicious. But what's super cool with fishes is that in addition to that variety we see just in their overall body plan, the variation and the specializations we see in their feeding structures, in my mind, are even cooler. And each of these enable them to exploit a different foraging habitat, which again helps to promote that coexistence. So we have things with lampreys with this two sucking disc that help them parasitize and attach to fishes, um, and things like billfish with this elongate rostrum that they use after they've uh, gotten their prey fish into these large prey balls. They essentially swim through the prey ball, whipping this rostrum around their bill and stunning these fish, and then they just go back up and gobble them. So again, each of these feeding structures, similar to what we saw in the body plan, is adapted to help these fishes be the best at exploiting whatever food item they are exploiting. And in addition, what in my mind is really, really neat about fishes is these are just examples of specializations to the oral jaws. Fishes are unique relative to other vertebrates in that they actually have two sets of jaws that are structurally and functionally independent of one another. another. And it's these two sets of jaws that have been an additional key driver for diversification in fishes. And so what we see is these forward-facing jaws are these, uh, what we call the oral jaws, and they're primarily used for prey capture. This is where they actually find their prey and capture it. However, posterior to that are the gill arches, which I've expanded out here so you can see. So we're looking from the top down on the gill arches, and I've dissected away this part that's so we can see at the tooth place. But there's these elements along the gill arches themselves that in addition to their respiratory function, are used for feeding. So there's structures along the gill arches called these gill rakers, as well as these tooth plates at the back of the gill arches that help fishes further process food. And a cool thing is that because they're structurally and functionally independent, the oral jaws can be uh, adapted and specialized to capture one type of prey, whereas the pharyngeal jaws can be adapted to, to help facilitate a broader foraging niche. So even though they might be not be as effective at capturing a different prey, they might be really good at processing it using their pharyngeal jaws. And 
So really what this kind of leads us to is the main theme of my talk, which are these relationships that exist between form and function. And so we recognize that links exist between an organism's morphology and their overall ecology. And when we think about feeding in fishes, these specializations to the feeding apparatus, which includes both these oral and pharyngeal jaw elements, have enabled fishes to exploit almost every known available um, foraging niche that we can think of as humans. And one of the things we need to consider though is when we think about foraging, it doesn't just include the ability to capture and process the prey. We have to think too about their ability to find the prey. So we must think about the sensory systems too if we're looking at foraging as a complete process. And we see a similar trend in the sensory systems in that the uh, primary senses that a fish uses to find its prey are matched to the prevailing sensory conditions. So if we just look at this example of an adult black drum, what we notice is that for its size, it has a relatively small eye, but these large nostrils and these little uh, whisker structures that we call barbels on the lower jaw. So what this is telling us is as adults, just looking at the peripheral sense organs, this black drum, Pagonius cronus, is primarily relying on sensory cues other than vision to find its prey. Probably some combination of olfaction using the nostrils and uh, gustation and touch using those barbels. Uh, and that's matched to their, where they're foraging for prey. They forage on large um, hard body bivalves that burrow in, or f burrow in the sediment but are also found along the sediment. So essentially, for the geologists out here, these guys induce their own turbidity. So as they're foraging, they make the water more turbid. So vision is not a great sense to have. So this brings in this idea of a match between the configuration of the feeding and the sensory systems and that it does limit the types of prey that these fishes, a particular fish species, can locate, capture, process, and ultimately consume. And when we think about why this idea of match or mismatch is important, it's because, again, these structures have evolved under non-perturbed settings. And the issues when we think about coastal ecosystems, and I'm going to introduce issues that are uh, important to Chesapeake Bay, although they are common in other coastal regions. Um, but as humans have moved into the area, we induce change to the prevailing foraging environment, which includes the sensory environment as well as the overall prey field. And that's through nutrient runoff, eutrophication, there's also climatic drivers. So the idea is that as we start to perturb the habitat, we're perturbing it faster than natural selection can act on these feeding and sensory systems to modify them so that they can still be effective. So the idea here is that as we start changing the sensory, the foraging environment and reducing the populations of the organisms that actually help buffer these environments from uh, changes to water quality, such as seagrass beds and oysters, we induce this situation where there's an increased potential of mismatch between the sensories and the feeding systems that fishes possess and how they're act in the environment in which they're foraging. So the idea is that we would see a reduction in foraging efficiency, which can reduce their overall condition and increase potential mortality. And so when we think of this from the adult perspective, it can be a little bit scary when you're trying to maintain uh, populations, sustainable fisheries, but one of the things that many um, um, aspects haven't been taken into account are the, lar the early stages, these larval fishes. And that's because they're even more susceptible to this idea of match and mismatch because they lack these lipid and fat reserves that would help sustain them in periods of fasting when they weren't able to effectively forage for prey. So in a situation where there's an increased potential for mismatch, especially in these early stages, we might see even more natural mortality in these early stages, which uh, translates up to lower populations and lower recruitment. Which brings me to the overall goal of my dissertation, which was to essentially establish a baseline. Because we actually don't know if these ecomorphological patterns are present in these early stage fishes. So even though we might know a lot about the adults, we don't necessarily know how the early stages are able to use these resources from the environment. So for my project, what I was looking at is to uh, basically describe the development of sensory modality, which is this sense or combination of senses used by an organism, and the feeding apparatus to see basically just how they develop. We don't know how they change through ontogeny. 
And then on top of that, I wanted to relate any changes we saw in the development of these two systems to their dietary, uh, to their diet, and if there were any dietary shifts in these early stages, to essentially establish that idea of are these ecomorphological um, trends present. And I use members of the family Cyanidae um, as a model group because they're a very speciose family globally with over 290 uh, described species. In addition, they exhibit a great deal of variation in the structure of their feeding apparatus as well as their sensory systems. And in particular for the Chesapeake Bay, um, there's about 14 species that use the bay seasonally as nurseries or foraging habitats. So there's this idea that there could be a lot of competition uh, among the different cyanus species. However, because they exhibit a great deal of variation in these um, feeding apparatus and sensory systems, they're actually able to coexist in these coastal habitats and partition their niches. Um, and that's, in my mind, super cool. Like, look at that. There's 14 species of the same family. And in the Chesapeake Bay, they occupy the broadest spectrum of any other fish family in regards to foraging. So we already know in the adults that they display these ecomorphological patterns. It helps them partition their niches. And they're occupying these various habitats in the Chesapeake Bay, from seagrass beds to the open water column to foraging in and along the bottom. But the idea is when do these ecomorphological patterns become apparent? And so to look at that, I classified these various uh, cyanate species of the Chesapeake Bay into three main foraging guilds based on where the adults are known to forage. So in blue, we have the pelagic foraging cyanates, and those are the ones that forage exclusively in the water column. It includes species like uh, Cynoceon regulus, which is the weak fish, and Cynoceon nebulosus, which is the spotted sea trout. And if you look at their body design, what you see is that they're relatively elongate, and they also have these large um, forward-facing jaws and a relatively large eye. So essentially, when they're foraging, they're foraging in the water column, and they're preying on these evasive, softer body fishes and shrimp. So when they locate their prey using their visual system, they're able to open their jaws and overtake their play, prey with these quick bursts of speed. And so that's how they're essentially foraging. However, when we compare this to adult generalist science seen here in the orange circles, um, they feed not just along the bottom, but also up in the water column on a variety of prey. And we see that their body shapes are more variable, but they tend to be deeper body, and they include species like Cyanops oscillatus, or red drum, and Atlantic croaker, or Micropagonius ondulatus. And again, what we're sort of seeing in their um, overall external morphology is that deeper body, but also these more downward-facing um, smaller jaws, as well as smaller eyes. And the final um, foraging guild that I examined were the benthic cyanids. And these are uh, in the brown color, and they feed exclusively along the bottom. And they tend to have even more deeper body, so they're very deep body. And if we're thinking about how this adaptation is useful, they're not swimming very quickly, but it helps them hover over the bottom. And they also have these small eyes and these extremely small downward facing jaws. So the idea is that they're deep body, they hover over the surface, they locate their prey, probably using a sense other than vision, and once they locate the prey, they project their jaws down and towards the sediment, and they essentially root around the sediment and vacuum up prey using their jaws. So I think they're super cool. And again, for geologists, these guys are major bioturbators, so they can mix the upper centimeter quite extensively in uh, certain regions. So the idea is once, now that I've given you an overview of these foraging guilds, this represents my ontogenic endpoints for uh, my study, in that we know members of each of these species belong to one of these three gills. So we know as late juveniles and adults, they are going to be exhibiting morphological and ecological characteristics of these three foraging gills. But I was interested to see when during ontogeny or development these patterns became apparent. So this is how I group the, the larvae. So the first thing I want to go through is answer the question, well, how do early stage cyanates actually find their food? What senses are they using? And there's a lot of different techniques to use, including histology and all that. I decided to use a technique where we essentially look at the morphology of the brain and the associated sensory brain regions. And what's really neat in fishes is that these sensory brain regions are very distinct. So here's two brains comparing a juvenile and an adult of the same species. 
And what you can see is up here are the olfactory region of the brain, and it's very distinct from here, which is the visual part of the brain. So you can see the changes that go as they grow from a juvenile into adults. So this was a very appealing technique to me. And again, I'm a morphologist, so I'm like, oh, a way to study morphology? Cool, let's do it. Um, so, and the idea here, though, is that this technique has only been used to study uh, sensory modality in larger fishes. And what they found is that the relative importance of that sense to a fish scales positively to the size of the corresponding sensory brain region. So this is really neat because just by looking at the brain, you don't have to do behavioral experiments. You can get at least a relative sense of how important that sensory ability is to those um, species. And this has been used in whale sharks, in other large pelagic sharks, as well as uh, pelagic teleos and mesopelagic fishes, so those found in the deep sea, to get an idea of what senses they're relying on in order to evade predators and find food. However, it hasn't yet been applied to very small early life history stage estuarine dependent fishes. And so part of the goal of this chapter was not just to look at the sensory development, but also see would this technique actually work. So I decided to not dissect out teeny tiny fish brains. And what I used instead was micro CT technology. So I had a collaborator at the University of Vienna. So I travel um, with my check luggage, a bunch of fish in my bag. And I took them to the university and we scanned them with this micro CT scanner. And we had a tissue stain that helped make this contrast. And essentially, once we scanned the fish, we got a bunch of these um, two-dimensional virtual histological slices. So super cool. I was like floored by how amazing it was. And then we're able to use um, image software programming. I used Amira, but there's also plugins for ImageJ to do this if anyone is trying to do this stuff. And I could then take all these two-dimensional slices from a fish head and put them together to make a 3D rendering. And from this 3D rendering, I was then able to mark the various regions of the brain for my comparison. And what I want to walk through is before I just hit you with the data, I want to let you know which sections of the brain I actually marked and what they do. <coughs> I'm also not going to say all the fancy names because I can't say half of them still. So the idea is in the purple part of the brain, these are the non-sensory regions of the brain. So they complete other key life history tasks, but they're not primarily responsible for processing this visual um, or this sensory information. The first sensory brain region I marked were the olfactory bulbs, which are here in this green color. And they extend from the front of the brain down to the base of the nostrils. And this, is, this whole length here is actually all an extension of the brain which I, that I thought was really cool. I didn't know the brain extended that far. Behind that is this turquoise area, which is where visual information is processed, and it's the optic tectum. And it extends from the eye into this top part of the brain. Posterior to that is this small little pink region. This is responsible for processing the information related to gustation or taste. If we look just below that, there's this red area this is the part of the brain that um, processes the information related to both hearing and mechanoreception. And that's because these senses tend to collect sensory stimuli very uh, similarly and respond to similar uh, cues. In addition, I, to try and tease apart the idea of how much is actually uh, related to hearing versus mechanoreception, I also looked at some of the auxiliary structures that are responsible for increasing or improving the sensitivity of hearing in fishes. And that includes the otolith volume. So I looked at the sagitta and the astrachus otoliths. Um, the sagitta is in yellow, and then the smaller one is in that teal color. And then I also looked at the distance of the swim bladder to the inner ear. Because in fishes, the closer your swim bladder is to your inner ear, and if you have any of these anterior projections, which are highlighted here in this royal blue color, this helps improve your uh, relative sensitivity, uh, hearing sensitivity. And then the swim bladder is in this gold color. So now I've kind of given you an overview of the different sensory brain regions I marked. I just want to start going through the data. Maybe. There we go. So what I have is the pelagic cyanates in this column, the generalists in the middle, and then our benthic cyanates are in this far column. And we're going to look at three size class. So this size class is our smallest, and if you're interested about the size, it's listed here. HL is head length, so that's just the length of the head. And then TL is total length in these individuals because that's the length of the total notochord. Um, after this size, uh, we're going to have a standard length measurement. 
Um, and so what we see is that these sizes, this is prior to settlement. So for those of you not as familiar with larval fish ecology, pretty much all fishes start their life up in the water column. They are pelagic fishes. And so they spend a certain period of time that's species dependent in the water column. But the idea is at some point they're going to head towards what we call a nursery habitat where they will settle. And so this is kind of that transition from their pelagic lifestyle to settlement is one of these really important um, life history transitions for larval fishes. So a lot of my sizes are kind of on before and after this settlement. So if we look at these scans, what we can see is the first thing that jumps out at us is this turquoise region or the visual part of the brain is the largest sensory brain region regardless of foraging habitat. So at this stage, fishes are relying primarily on visual cues. However, if we look at the plastic science, we do see some enlargement of this olfactory region, but particularly this pink gustatory region, as well as this red hearing mechanoreceptive area. And in addition, in the generalists, we also see some enlargement of this red hearing mechanoreceptive center. So they're starting to be more sensitive, potentially, to some of these other secondary cues that would help inform what they're the information they're receiving from their visual system. If we look after settlement in these larger sizes, what we see is that the visual center is still the largest part of the brain regardless of habitat, but we're starting to see more development along these secondary sensory brain regions, particularly if we look at the general science in this olfactory region, as well as the gustatory in the pink and this hearing mechanoreceptive area in the red, as well as these extremely large otoliths um, that are still not quite present in our pelagic science. But what I thought was surprising is I was expecting a bit more uh, development along the olfactory region in these benthic science, but they seem at this point to still be primarily responding to uh, visual cues and not really using a lot of other inf sensory information or sensitive to other sensory stimuli. However, by the juvenile phase, we do see there's not much change in the generalist science, just that there's more development in these relative secondary sensory regions. In the pelagic science, we start to see these anterior projections appear on the swim bladder, suggesting they're becoming more sensitive to um, auditory or hearing cues. But what's interesting is we finally start to see some specialization in the benthic science, where finally this olfactory region in green has elongated and is now well developed, as well as this pink gustatory region. So essentially, if we sum up what we saw in this part, uh, this section, Regardless of ontogenetic stage or foraging habitat, vision was the primary sense of the early stage science. So regardless, vision is primarily the sensory cue that they're sensitive to. However, when we think about some of these other senses that are helping to inform the, the visual systems, we start to see some interesting trends. Where, for example, for the pelagic science, we see that they're not very sensitive to a lot of different sensory stimuli. But at about settlement, we, start, we see a transition from them being uh, sensitive to taste to becoming more sensitive to auditory cues. Whereas for the generalist science, we see an expansion of their um, sensory sensitivity or expected sensory sensitivity by settlement, and that continues on through the settlement stage. Whereas for the benthic science, we don't see a, really a lot of sensory um, development along these other sensory brain regions until the juvenile stage, where we expect them to be more sensitive to olfactory and gustatory cues. So this gives us a launching point of now we have an idea of how these larval fishes, these larval science, are able to um, find prey and evade predators, as well as locate settlement habitats. So this brings us to the next part, which is how are they actually able to capture the prey they can now see? So <coughs> for this part of the talk, I used uh, clear and stained specimens. So you've already seen some of these pictures, and they're a little bit brighter than they normally are. But the idea here is anything that is red is a calcified structure, where anything that shows up blue is a cartilage structure. And what's really cool is in this technique, we also make the tissue itself transparent, so you can see through the fish. And this lets us study the development of these various structures in the fish itself. And I did further dissections, but it's I love it. Like I st We do it for fun now at GCRL, so I'm like, ugh. But it's really cool, and it really highlights some of these structures that are hard to see on a um, newly preserved fish. Like teeth tend to like disappear into the uh, pigments when you're trying to look at them. 
So this is one of the ways to look at internal morphology and in the development of these skeletal elements. And once I obtained my measurements of the data, I then plugged it into a multivariate regression tree, which helped me identify points during ontogeny when the, uh, feeding, the structure of the feeding apparatus uh, differentiated and also indicated what elements were responsible for those differentiation events. So I just want to quickly walk through some of the measurements I took. So once I had my whole fish, I took these three measurements and a lot of my feeding apparatus elements, you already saw the head length. I used head length because m pretty much all the structures I was looking at were isolated in the head. So this was a nice metric for comparison when I'm looking at different species that as adult fish could reach huge dip size differences at their maximum length. So this was a way to help me compare. From the oral jaws, basically I had this nice fish and I, say I just ripped off his face and that's how I looked at the oral jaws. <laughs> and I took measurements of the total length of the lower jawbone I took a length of the upper jawbone, jawbone indicated by this, this is premaxilla, and then I also took a length of this bone process on the upper jaw called the ascending process. And if I have to pick a favorite bone, it's probably going to be the ascending process. And that's because functionally this bone is responsible for the protrusion of the jaws. And how it does this is it basically acts as a guide on a track. So as the jaws start to move down, this, so it's located up in here, this slides down pushing the upper jaw forward and that's how we get our jaw protrusion. So the ascending process is a very special bone to me. And then if we look at the gill arches, I also looked at um, the structure of the gill rakers, the relative lengths of these gill filaments, these blue things here, as well as the tooth area of these um, three tooth plates at the back of the gill arches. And so the black outlines just indicate how I actually took that toothed area on the lower tooth plate, denoted by this abbreviation, and these two upper tooth plates. So what we found from the multivariate regression tree is that there were three points during ontogeny where the elements of the feeding apparatus began to differentiate. And each differentiation event was attributed to a different feature of the feeding apparatus. So I'm just going to walk through some of the changes we saw. It's a similar setup to what we saw in the sensory part, but we have pelagic science in this top row, generalist in the middle, and then benthic on the bottom. And what I want to highlight is before settlement or differentiation of any of those other feeding apparatus elements, the gill rakers, which are these nubbins here along the arm of the gill arch, are very similar in shape among the three foraging gills. They tend to be all this peak shape, and they don't have uh, these spicule structures as prominent. However, after we start to see some differentiation of the feeding apparatus and around settlement, we start to see some differences, particularly if we look at the benthic science, they now have these extremely peaked gill rakers here that are capped with these very elongate spicules. And it, it's crazy looking when you look at them under the microscope. And if we compare that to the generalist science, they have these more cylindrical um, gill rakers that are capped with these very short spicules. And even further, when we look at the, uh, the pelagic science, excuse me, they have more mound-like gill rakers that are covered with these shorter, dense patches of spicules. And if we look after differentiation of the, of the feeding apparatus and into the juvenile stage, we see that these differences we observed after settlement become even more pronounced. So the next structure that was identified to lead to differentiation of the feeding apparatus was the length of the premaxilla or the upper jaw in the oral jaws. And similar to what we saw in the gill rakers is that they're very similar, or there's a lot of similarities in the structure of the oral jaws regardless of the foraging habitat. They all possess these relatively elongate upper and lower jaw bones. However, after settlement and some of this differentiation occurs, we see that the um, benthic science have these noticeably shorter upper and lower jaw bones, as well as this extremely robust ascending process compared to the generalist and the pelagic cyanus. And if we look even later during ontogeny, we see that now the generalist cyanus also possess these relatively shorter upper and lower jaw bones, as well as a more um, distinct ascending process that's more similar in shape and structure to the benthic science than it is the pelagic science. And one of the things I also want to bring your attention to is if we just look at the pelagic science quickly, what we can notice is that the relative structure and configuration of their jaws actually doesn't really change through ontogeny. 
We see increases in the number of teeth, but overall, when we look at the shape of the jaw, it remains very similar. And the final element I just want to show you guys are the uh, three tooth plates of the pharyngeal jaw. So we have our lower tooth plate and then our two upper tooth plates here. And again, similar trend. Very, they're very similar among the three foraging guilds early during ontogeny. After settlement, we see that the benthic science are morphologically distinct from the generalists in the pelagic science in that their uh, tooth, the upper tooth plates are rounded and there's these patches of malariform teeth on both the upper and the lower tooth plate. So there's tooth type specialization. And this helps them grind these harder prey items that they capture and consume. And then after um, uh, differentiation of this uh, feeding apparatus is complete, we see that unlike what we saw in the oral jaws, the general science still have tooth plates that are more similar in shape to the pelagic cyanus than they are to the benthic cyanus. So if we summarize what we saw, <coughs> as I mentioned, the regression tree identified three points during ontogeny where we saw differentiation of the feeding apparatus. And it was attributed to these three different structures. But what's really interesting from those images we saw is that the benthic guild is morphologically distinct from the other two foraging guilds by about 22 millimeters standard length. So this is just after settlement. In addition, when we looked at the generalists, they had these morphological traits that are similar, some are similar to the benthic science, such as the structure of their oral jaws, whereas others are more similar to pelagic science, such as the structure of their uh, pharyngeal jaws. So when we think about the uh, separation in structure and function of the oral and the pharyngeal jaws, these generalists are actually exemplifying that idea in that their oral jaws are adapted for one lifestyle, however their pharyngeal jaws are adapted to a different lifestyle so that they have this wider uh, spectrum of prey that they're able to exploit. So now we know how fishes are able to find and capture their food and process it. So we pretty much, we've identified the morphology part of ecomorphology. So now it's time to jump into, well, how does this actually correspond to anything in the diet? And I'm just going to do a quick overview of what I saw in the diet, but essentially um, I did a gut content analysis and I took guts from representative species of these three different foraging guilds, I identified the stomach contents into the lowest possible taxonomic level, and then I grouped the, grouped the prey into broader groupings based on the prey's primary habitat. So I had prey categories like benthic crustaceans, pelagic crustaceans, benthic shrimp, pelagic shrimp, and so on. Um, and my metric for comparison was mean percent number, and that's because it handles well in situations where you have small sample sizes or one um, prey item dominating the diet. And for this part, I'm just going to present on the results of the dietary shift. So I use hierarchical clustering to identify if and when dietary shifts occur. So if we just throw up our three different uh, cluster analysis for the pelagic, generalist, and benthic cyanus, what I've done is I've highlighted in the shading box the, the second cluster. So in, regardless of foraging habitat, we see a single dietary shift. But the timing of this dietary shift differs depending on the foraging guild. So what we see is that the first dietary shift was observed in the pelagic science at 16 millimeters standard length. And for those of you who aren't as familiar with uh, cluster analysis, what this is telling us is these individuals in these smaller size bins in the black text, their diet is sim similar to each other, but it's significantly different from the diet of those specimens larger than 16 millimeters that belong to this second cluster denoted by the red text. Our next diet shift was observed in the benthic cyanus at about 20 millimeters, and in our th the general science followed later during ontogeny at about 35 millimeters standard length. So if we now put this together in that ecomorphological uh, context, what we see is that these dietary shifts correspond to different things depending on, or different events depending on the foraging guild that we're talking about. So for instance, with the pelagic cyanus, their dietary shift was at 16 millimeters standard length, which corresponds approximately to when we see a shift in their sensory modality in that they're sensitive to taste, but also these auditory uh, sensory stimuli. However, as I pointed out in the feeding apparatus, really there's not a lot of changes in the configuration of the feeding apparatus structure. So what this is telling us is that 
in order for these pelagic cyanates to undergo this dietary shift, they're limited not by the structure of their jaws, but by the ability to actually locate and sense their prey, detect their prey. So once the sensory, uh, we observe this shift in sensory modality and their sensory system becomes more sensitive to these other cues, they're able to efficiently detect these potential prey items and begin efficiently exploiting them. For the benthic science, however, their uh, diet shift at 20 millimeters corresponds approximately to when they became morphologically distinct from the other two foraging gills. But we saw later that they didn't really have a shift in their sensory modality until later in ontogeny. So this suggests for the benthic cyanates, they are able to sense their prey, but they're not as able to actually exploit their prey effectively until we start to see more differentiation and development in the jaw structures. And finally, our interesting case are general science. So their dietary shift was sort of in the middle of when their jaws became distinct from the pelagic and the uh, benthic science, but also after um, their ability to be sensitive to this variety of uh, sensory cues. So this suggests for them that really it's this interaction between the feeding and the sensory systems in that they're starting to be sensitive to and locate these various prey, but they're not very effective at first capturing or processing that prey until later during ontogeny. And so the, to summarize this part of the talk, we, we did identify these ecomorphological patterns in these early stage fishes. And so this helps us understand for um, this group of fishes, the cyanids, how they're able to partition their foraging in these early stages within these nursery habitats and how they're able to coexist in times when many of the species come into these nursery habitats together. And in addition, we've seen a lot of loss in these foraging habitats. So this is good that in these early stages, they're already able to partition their foraging because it can enable them to coexist in these um, nursery habitats. <coughs> so as Jeff already mentioned, and I swear it's just a couple slides left, um, I'm now working as a postdoc um, for this um, uh, Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative funded project called Concord. So the goal of this project is to assess the biophysical impact of freshwater discharge events, which here we are at Dolphin Island, on the near shore environment. So we have these three regions that we sample in, and we have this one in the e to the east of us, which has very low freshwater input. We have just south of us, I think we can see it if we looked out there. We have this region, which has these periodic pulses of fresh water from the Mobile Bay. Um, as well as from some of these barrier island inlets. And finally, we have this western region that gets freshwater input from the Mississippi Sound to the north of it and the Chandelier Sound to the east of it. And I cut it off in the map, but also here's Lake Pontchartrain. So when you have things like the Bonnie Carey Spillway open, we actually can detect that um, in where we're sampling with that freshwater discharge. So the idea here is this is a very large oceanographic research project, and I've just presented it on like 45 minutes of morphology. So where do I fit in? Uh, so the idea, though, is that this is a perfect situation to study ecomorphology. And that's because we've, I've already hopefully convinced you that the foraging habitat changes. Because it changes through growth, that means our nu nutritional requirements are changing. We saw from the cyanids that the ecomorphological patterns are here and present. So we can study how these fishes are able to obtain nutrients from the environment to understand what exactly they're doing. And the cool thing is these morphological data are actually predictive. So once you establish it in one group of fishes, like the cyanids, which fortunately for me occupy a lot of different foraging habitats, you can start to selectively apply it to maybe some other groups to see if some of these trends are similar. So I just used an example of a mahi because they're cool and they had really nice pictures. And so the idea here is that this is a backscatter image, and I think this is from February 10th or 11th, and it shows this freshwater discharge from the Mobile Bay. And we actually sampled sites inside of this and outside of this. So the idea is how does the condition of fishes change from within the plume where theoretically there's a lot of prey, um, there's a, so it should be a great foraging environment. But when we're, th we're thinking about from the prey perspective uh, for the fishes, there's also some stressors there. There's more predators. There's also potential for increased uh, turbidity. So if they're relying on visual cues, which we saw from the uh, cyanids, that they tend to be more visual predators at these small stages, 
They might not actually be good as finding their food, even though it's basically just hitting them in the face. Whereas in these um, outside the plume areas, the prey field itself might not be as dense, but maybe there's better conditions where they're better able to find their actual food. So this is where I envision fitting in, and we do have a student that's working on comparing the conditions, and I'm hoping to tag on to that with looking from the ecomorphology perspective of, okay, if we see differences in condition, why are we actually seeing these differences? What's different in the skeleton or in the sensory systems that could be affecting that? So with that, I'd just like to thank you guys for all your attention as well as my co-authors and work, everyone else I work with. So, <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. I think we have time for questions. Anyone? Anyone? Um, so there's this whole idea that ontogeny and phylogenies are related, and so I was wondering if you looked at phylogenetic relationships and if your ontogenetic shifts um, were at all related to ancestral states, or if, if that if you considered that at all. For the people on the internet. <laughs> My advisor is going to be so excited somebody asked me that. So yes, we did take that into account. So that's actually um, one of the components I didn't um, present on today. So we did look at the phylogenetic history of these guys, because as you know, and um, for the rest of you, so cyanates belong to the same family. So these are the drums. Um, they're closely related. So the idea is that, well, they're, because they're closely related, that's why they have the structures that they do. So it could be derived by history, their evolutionary history. So we did look into that. And what we found is that for the pelagic cyanates, they were essentially free from any limitations of phylogenetic history on the feeding apparatus structures we looked at. For the, cyan for the benthic um, cyanate, it was a little bit more complicated of a story because um, some of their structures were restricted to basically they have short jaws because their ancestors had short jaws. So that's what they can do. But we did see that, it, for example, the length of the premaxilla, which can help so it's the ascending process that's facilitating the movement of the jaws, but the length of the premaxilla can also help in alter like that overall configuration of where the, if the jaw is pointing more straight out or f straight down to the bottom. So that one was free. So even though they are somewhat limited of like, okay, you're a benthic planet, you're going to be foraging along the bottom because of evolutionary history, there is some um, area for natural selection to act on the upper jaw to tweak uh, pretty much where the jaws are pointing, that kind of idea. Does that get at your question? Yeah. Okay. Yay. Um, along the same lines, um, did you, you talk about at what sizes these different groups tend to switch. Did you get a sense of the plasticity? Like, is there a big range at what that occurs at and, and how that's affected by the environment? So yeah, so like for instance, I looked at black drum, which is the largest drum species on record. It gets to like 80 kilos, it's humongous. And I also compared, uh, looked at things like silver perch, Baradiella chrysora, which gets maybe like that big. So the idea is in the standard length, there's a whole bunch of room where we might be losing some of that sensitivity to detect. Um, when these changes are occurring because it's kind of like comparing apples and oranges in a sense. But when I use the head length, essentially the size of the head helps scale everything because the head itself is um, going to set everything proportional um, to the structures we are looking at. So that's why I use that. Um, for my project, I was my size range I tried to keep fairly restrictive. So I look just after hatching at about two millimeters uh, and I think at most there are some individuals that are like 88 millimeters standard length. For me, I didn't age uh, fishes, so I didn't look particularly at the individual plasticity aspect. So I can't tell you like um, within a species what the range was when we started to see these different uh, changes occur. That's one of those things I'd love to do future, in the future as a, an experiment to see when we start to see the onset of these changes and how it differs from individual to individual.
can do one or two more questions. Yeah, the hot spot. So with, with these larval fish, how important is um, mortality by starvation versus predation? And could that affect the relative sizes of the sensory parts of their brain? Yeah, so that's a great question, and it's a really difficult one to tease apart. Because the idea is that we can't just... So I came at it from the foraging perspective of like, oh yeah, the sensory ability, that's totally helping them find prey. But you're very correct in that it's also, sensory systems are being used to, at the same time, help a fish, larval fish, evade predators and find settlement habitats. So there is this potential of some confounding factors in there of the development of sensory systems are not gonna be solely related to foraging. I tackled it from a foraging perspective. Um, right now, with what I did, I'm not 100% sure how I would tease those apart. That would be one of those behavioral or looking at tank experiments, that kind of deal, um, to tease that apart. But that's a great consideration. So thank you for bringing that up. Final question over here. Are you looking at how anthropogenic toxins in the environment can affect the fish's larval development in any way? Like like when we just had the Gulf oil spill? Or right now, no. Um, we have some people um, at the Gulf Coast Research Lab that are looking at the effects of toxicants on larval development. That's not something I'm particularly working on, but we have discussed with me clearing and staining some of their material to see if there's changes to the skeletal elements or the onset of um, uh, ossification in these different things. Because that setup, that laboratory setup, is a perfect way to look at things like phenotypic plasticity and the effects of different um, agents on their growth. So not yet, but hopefully. So can we give her one more hand? Thank you. Thank you. And there are a couple more time slots open this afternoon. If anyone wants to meet with her, uh, please just come see me afterwards. Thank you.